Why, hello there, and welcome back to Watchbox. This is Watches Tonight, and I am your host, Tim Masso. This evening, we are discussing watches that fall just short of perfection. We're looking at a couple of exemplars that fixed their deficiencies. I've got one of the worst Aston Martin ads you've ever seen on Auto Trader, and we're going over what we need to do to make these nearly watches champions in their class. All of that, and I'm sharing your viewer wrist chats. As I can see, Blue Shirt Buddha, Burning Mr. B, Edward Ledden, Alan L, Thomas M, Marco B, and Mr. No Date already live in the box. You guys are quick to the draw. Let's take a look at some of yours on mine. Viewer wrist chats number one, starting with Sean B of Texas with his watch box sourced Breitling Chronomat weathering the workday. Thank you so much for trusting our company. We've got Joseph C. of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and his Louis Errard, Le Régulateur, by Alain Silberstein, the famed independent and independent pioneer that is a collaboration, limited edition, and as you can see, he is the Halloween spirit. He's got it going. Edward B. and his Gerard Perigo Laureato, Make Time for Tea, appetizing. I could use a little caffeine right now myself. And Mikhail B. of Poland and his Omega Seamaster Aquaterra. Enjoy the fall sunshine. I don't know why the picture just shrunk, but Mikhail, thank you for being a regular contributor to our wrist shots. All right, I can see we got quite a few fans streaming in right here. We've got Mr. No Date, Ordinary 999 from Norway, Richard Combs from South Florida, Watched Watchusiest from Dubai joining in. Staying up late, I must say. We've got Love Watches USA, Cull Obsidian. We've got Adam Crossfire. Thomas M is joining in from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the home of Arthur Fonzarelli. We've got Muhammad A joining from the UAE. And we've got Neo, the 95th Phantom, P&T, Mr. Fenimore, Ted Hopper, Turkish Meister from Turkey, Mark S from Brooklyn. And we have the pigs in blankets from San Francisco on the American left coast. All right, guys, jumping straight into something that is entirely axle spinning, or I should say axle high centering and wheel spinning fun. This is nonsense. And I realize people start to filter in the longer we stay live. So I'm going to give you some time to gather yourselves. And while we await our guests, some comic relief, like I said, spin in tires. And that is a most apropos analogy. Most of our viewers know that I am also a car enthusiast and a big car fan, and I have been longer than I've been a watch guy. And I'm moving closer to a return to the car enthusiast community. I feel like I've been around long enough without a car that I feel that gap, that, that absence in my soul. And I'm drawn towards brands that have emotional associations with my childhood. So like most car enthusiasts, I tend to focus on a handful of models that have gripped me for a really long time. And the Generation 1 Aston V12 Vanquish is definitely that high on the list, maybe even at the top of the list. But this Aston Martin ad might inspire me to resurrect our Hall of Shame feature on the show. See that? Florida listing. I should have stopped right there, but I didn't. I kept clicking, and you'll be glad I did. So, it's from a used dealer in Florida, and frankly, that should have been the ultimate red light. Problem started with, well, starting the car. This seems pretty fundamental. The keys didn't look right. Take a quick look at those. Notice anything? Well, there are some problems with attention to detail, as this is apparently a key set for a Jaguar XKR from 2006. That's a bit of a downgrade. Yeah, they've both got four wheels, multiple cylinders, and they make loud noises, but that's a big miss. A red flag? Oh yeah. And then the Carfax suggested a branded title based on odometer issues. Uh, and possibly geographic confusions with the titles being issued either by Chicago, Illinois, or the California Department of Motor Vehicles. I have no idea. It lists both. And then I hit the description. And this is where things get really fun. And I remember my days as a base newspaper editor in the Navy. And I found a lot of problems there. I found more problems here. As you can see, this one reads like a presidential tweet. We've got uppercase where it should be lowercase. We've got some awkward phraseology of kafifi level. We've got spelling issues. Something called a V12F is under the hood of this car. Uh, issues with 
that and who when discussing people. And then it has a clear Carfax, which, as I've already noted, is a sort of clear Carfax. So to say there are problems here with the $70,000 car listing, that's an understatement. I would also mention that this Aston Martin listing couldn't have come from any place but Florida, where this is exactly how you list a $70,000 car. Because apparently even James Bond can be Florida man. Take that, New York, California, and the Midwest. All right, jumping into the box, I could see Roar the Tiger saying Carfax is so unreliable. <laughs> Believe me, I know. All right, watches that fall just short of greatness. Let's see who's joining us. Naresh Pape from Canada. We got Harry W. We have, uh, by, Nare by the way, Naresh, thanks for joining in on a live show. I know you've been away for a while. You're a longtime viewer, and I appreciate that. We've got Bob L. We've got Stratford 1. We've got Ahmad A. joining in. Hello, Kevin S. We've got Anastase, Roar of the Tiger. You could not be more right about Carfax. And then we have Edward Ledden of Sweden, noting that this one appears to be a Jaguar. Warning signs. Much? Yeah. So watches that fall just short of greatness. Let's talk about these watches because it seems there's been a lot of them lately. At any given time, in any given era, the watch market is swimming in satisfactory models that would be clear class leaders with only a few changes. Often, a mid-cycle update is all that's really required in order to right the wrongs and make these superior products. All that would be required sometimes is just a quick refinement to turn a Woodrow Wilson watch into an FDR watch. A subtle distinction, but a big one, especially when money's on the line, and in the watch industry, it always is. So before we start the roll call of nearly watches, it's worth taking a look at models that made the leap from good to great with targeted changes for the better. So let's start with the biggest name in watches, Rolex, and the 2018 Rolex Deep Sea. This was not the original Deep Sea. That came out 10 years prior in 2008. And well, there were issues with the original. While it was the most technically proficient Rolex watch you could buy in any class, and easily the most capable diver Rolex had ever built, uh, there were issues with the proportion of the bracelet to the lugs, the lug-to-lug -lug dimension, the end-link-to-end-link -end -link dimension, the way it looked, the way it wore, the issues people with smaller wrists had wearing this as anything other than a party watch. But in 2018, Rolex heard the pleas and made major changes, not just to the way the watch looked, it did look better, but also to the way it wore. There was a new movement on the inside and a slightly revised dial, all of which is to say with revised lug width, end link width, lug to lug span, end link to end link span, an all new bracelet and movement, it became more viable for someone, say, like me to actually wear this watch with a straight face. A lot of people were able to get in on the action who previously wouldn't have touched this thing as it was almost like wearing a diving style big pilot. Big improvement, now a class leading product. Let's take a small brand, okay? The opposite of Rolex. Innovative, techie, low volume, HYT. The HYT H1 was cool with its hydromechanical time display. It's like a modern day clepsydra. The problem, at 48.8 millimeters, it made an Hublot King Power look petite. No normal person could wear this watch. And you can only book so many sales to Sylvester Stallone, Bruce Willis, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. So what did they do? Well, the 2017 H0 fixed all the problems. Still 48.8 millimeters, what changed? The lugs are gone. This was a style that was quasi-popular in the 1970s, but fundamentally a great idea. Because when a watch is 48 millimeters lug to lug, that's a big difference from being a round watch that's 48.8. This watch, lug to lug, is shorter across the wrist than a Daytona on a bracelet. Suddenly, everyone, instead of no one, can wear an HYT, expanding the market, but also substantially improving the product, making it what it should have been in the beginning, as ergonomically innovative as it was technically revolutionary. So, Tudor, dive watches, the Black Bay. Tudor's 2016 edition of a manufacturer movement to the Black Bay line resolved one of the issues people had, is essentially, why would you buy a Tudor if you could just get a Longines with an ETA movement? But while Tudor undoubtedly increased the value proposition when buying the Black Bay, the 41 millimeter watch, now 15 millimeters thick, was rather bulky. It neither looked nor felt authentically vintage on the wrist. 
all of which was rectified in 2018 with the Black Bay 58. A more historically true 39 millimeters and now 11.9 millimeters thick, it was no longer chunky, giving up almost nothing to a contemporary Rolex Submariner. One was tempted to ask at the time why you would even buy a Rolex sub when this was on the market. Now a true class leading product and they went all the way as they even created a more compact properly sized movement just for this model and that's saying something considering there's no display case back. So Audemars Piguet, this is going to be the last example I have of a company fixing something that came so close to excellence and the line between excellence and virtual pariah status in AP's case was never more distinct or thinner than with the 2019 Code 1159 collection. Now that's the chronograph right there. There were no issues with the sonnery, no issues with the tourbillon. Those looked as expensive as they were and the same was true of the perpetual calendar with its lovely aventurine dial. The problem was the chronograph and the automatic which wound up looking cheap and flat because though money was spent on the dials, it didn't come across in pictures and when viewed from the front head-on soldier shot angle that's ubiquitous online, these watches looked so anodyne they could have cost a hundred bucks or at least that was the perception. But here's the thing, we saw that improvements were possible with the basic model thanks to 2019's 99 piece Bolshoi Theater limited edition. Built for the Russian market, it took the automatic movement in case and added a gradient fade enamel dial. It was big time expensive but it was also big time gorgeous, which is to say Audemars Piguet found the solution and it was a basic and easy and obvious one. Just take the gradient fade from, for example, the sonnery or the tourbillon dials, do it in lacquer, bring it over to the automatic and the chronograph and you've fixed the problem. And indeed, it took nothing more than a year two dial swap to make the code 1159 look as expensive as it is. And for once, you could see where the money was spent without having to fondle the case, turn it over, examine its geography, its crevices. It's a great looking watch and an interesting fabrication, but 90% of the love affair with a watch is gonna be the dial. 5% is going to be the case in the lugs and 5% is going to be the movement. We don't like to admit it, but it's often true. If the dial looks cheap, if it looks sterile, if it looks anodyne or anonymous, you've already lost. It doesn't matter how good the movement in the case are. And in the case, pun intended, of the 1159, the hardware was absolutely wonderful. Now it finally looks like the class leading product it could be. So let's take a look in the chat right here. We have quite a few people joining in. Oops, let me see if I can bring the chat back. We've got Nordic Monkey joining in from Sweden saying he hopes he didn't miss anything. You missed an awful car listing, which is to say you missed very little watch content. Right here, we've got Abdul R joining from the Black Forest in Germany. We've got Eric S joining from the land of bourbon in Kentucky, USA. And right here, Gregory Wirtz saying, still has the terrible date windows, hands, and fonts. So not everyone is a fan of the revised code 1159. And then we've got Roy B saying, the marketing on the 1159 was super pretentious too. I don't know why that struck me so strongly. You're not wrong. I was there at SIHH during the rollout and it was too hip for its own good. So if you perceive that from 3,000 plus miles away, I've got to say you're onto something and they had a big miss in how those things were rolled out. They acted as though they were the kings of the world and the battle was already won. Frankly, they were also realistic about what needed to be fixed, but I just wonder inside of AP, who had so much raw, undivided, unquestionable power that he made that call on the dial without repercussions from any advisors or a course correction. Something to think about. Okay, Brick Lane saying, I would love Universal Genève to come back with a bang. Not a bad idea, but not just for the sake of reviving it. There would have to be something new and worthwhile about it. We've got enough vintage reissues and revived brands. And then right here, we've got Kevin S. in a paraphrase of the famous Patek Philippe tagline, you don't just own a code 1159, you hold it until you flip it. Although frankly, flipping is generally a pretty good sign of the pre-owned market for a watch and AP would probably like to see a little bit more of that with the code 1159. All right, let us jump straight into one of my favorite segments, which is your segment. You are the star 
and so is your watch, viewerist chats too. Mr. Enigma launches us in with a classical wrist chat featuring his Tudor Prince Day Date. We've got Soma R of Hungary, who waited 30 years since age five in childhood to realize his dream of owning a Breitling Navitimer. Congratulations and wear it in good health. Barry D, collector and watch box customer, flies the flag for Frankfurt, Germany with his Zinn EZM13 diving chrono. We've got Dave C of the UK, reports from London with his Rolex GMT Master 2 CHNR. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com as I like to say to see your watches on this box. All right. Thomas UWM is saying, Tudor Day Date, terrific to see. Mine says hello. And then Marcus G saying, wow, mature five-year-old who wanted a Breitling so early, beautiful Navitimer. But I can relate to that because there were cars that I liked when I was five that I still like today. I can easily see it happening with a watch. And then right here, we've got Horatio mentioning, a good dose of humility wouldn't hurt Francois-Henri Benamia of Audemars Piguet. Look, clearly they course corrected. It took a year, it shouldn't have taken five months, but all the same, if he was responsible, he admitted fault and they fixed the watch. But I got to agree, year one, someone had the all important final say and it probably wasn't an underling. All right, jumping into Stratford one. Anyone from Portland? Do we have anyone from Portland here? Mark S, Tim, riff on AMG versus BMW M line versus Audi SRS. It's tough to say because it used to be that there was such a distinct character difference between an AMG and a motorsport product that you would never confuse the two. In general, motorsport was a lighter car, a smaller base vehicle. You'd never see something like an X6M or an SUV with motorsport treatment in the 90s. Back then it was naturally aspirated M3s and M5s and there was never an M7. If you had a tuned 7, it was an Alpina, not a motorsport product. Today, with turbos, stability control, torque vectoring differentials, all-wheel drive, massive weight, they seem the same to me. So if I were to compare motorsport to AMG, I would say AMG does the thrust and the sound and the feel better. And these days, the motorsports cars more and more just feel like nine tenths or eight tenths versions of AMGs. As for Audi S and RS, historically, well, there's not as much history there. But I would say if I could own just one car from Audi Sport, BMW Motorsport, or Mercedes AMG, it would be the 1980s. Audi Sport Quattro with a wheelbase that's about that long and 450 horsepower. That was probably the most extreme rally intent car ever made. And I would almost kill, almost kill to have one of those legal for US roads. So I'm an Audi fan at heart, but I will admit that AMG is pretty much the best game in town for German tuners today, today. Historically, probably motorsport. Okay, jumping into major group watches that need to find a sixth gear to keep our automotive analogy going. So these are gonna be big group watches that are close to being great, but right now they're only good. And we're gonna start with Vacheron Constantin, the oldest continuously operating watch brand in Switzerland, but they have not learned a critical lesson in all of those centuries, which is basically, that watch collectors want steel. Let's talk about the Vacheron Constantin Overseas Ultra Thin, a new model for 2016 for the Generation 3 Overseas family. This was the first ever Overseas designed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the equivalent thin core models from Audemars Piguet and Patek. So the specs were impressive. 7.5 millimeters thick, thinner than the Nautilus, thinner than the Royal Oak Jumbo, 40 millimeters, no date dial, the same movement you find in a Royal Oak Jumbo, but with Geneva Hallmark, anti-magnetic, and I think it's also important to note it had the same system as the other overseas, coming with two straps, a spare deployment clasp, and a fully sizable bracelet with quick release lugs. This should have been a class leading product. The problem, it cost $51,000, solely because Vacheron, again, not learning its lessons during the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and first half of the 2010, launched the watch in white gold. People don't want elemental sports watches in gold or platinum. They want steel. And so this one material spec decision took what could have been a Royal Oak and Nautilus killer and relegated it to a status of nearly forgotten. 
It's true, a lot of folks don't even know this watch existed. And that's a shame because the design, like I said, had everything necessary to gut punch the regulars and the standards in the class. Think about this. The Patek 5711 is a watch that costs 33,710 US dollars. You'll pay more used, but if you're on the dealer wait list, that's what you're going to pay to get it new. The Royal Oak Jumbo, the 15202 ST, this is a watch that in the US is $25,600. Again, there's going to be a wait list and a markup if you buy it used, but if you get it new, it's going to be under 26 grand before tax. The Vacheron at 51,000 was not an established player in this segment. A lot of folks didn't even know it was available, and the price was so high that it was rarely ever seen in dealer cases, much less sold at anywhere near retail. So bring it back, Vacheron. I know it's discontinued, but bring it back. Bring it back in steel. Or if you want to be cool, do it in tantalum. And assume class leadership, because you've got the basic product to make that happen. The Patek Philippe Nautilus, the 5711, it's not perfect. There are many changes we could make, but a few small ones would reestablish its status as the top dog in the space. So here's the oddity. In 2012, Patek Philippe downgraded the model, actually degraded the quality of the bracelet by changing from the previous removable links fixed by screws to removable links now held in place by 90s tag Hoyer style pin sleeves. Not a great change. Why? I have to assume that cost was the reason, but here's the thing. If you want to size that bracelet, you have to line up a punch and a block like you're sizing a graduation watch for some kid during the 1990s. And that shouldn't be the case with the Patek Philippe. It shouldn't be sized like an old Omega Seamaster. There should be screws in that bracelet. AP does it, Vacheron does it, Patek should do it. But since we're changing the 5711, and the model's been around since 2006, Patek did upgrade it last year with a new hacking movement, and that's a definite investment. I give them a lot of credit for that. But the 5711 must be approaching the end of the line, as it's been around for 14 years. So what would I change? I would say go back to screws in the bracelet for the next generation of the watch, but also go back to the original 1976 Gerald Genta patented monoblock case construction. You see, that's how the original 3700 was built. It attained water resistance more than twice that of the Royal Oak, precisely because the entire backside of the case was solid, seamless, one piece, and then the bezel and the winglets would clamp down on the seals and achieve that buffo water resistance. Here's the thing, though. That costs money, I understand, but at these price points, it should be expected. And we know this can be done with the display case back because AP did it for years on the 15202 and Patek did it briefly in the late 2000s on the 5800 Nautilus midsize. So we know you can have a monoblock case with a display case back. So, Bulgari. Bulgari now gets discussed in the same breath as Vacheron and Patek. And that alone should be a sign of success. Indeed, Bulgari is one of the hot brands of the moment, riding a high from the 2017 launch of the Octo Finissimo Automatic. But the Bulgari Octo Finissimo 100 meter came out this model year, and this watch is now so close to perfection. So close because while the original Octo Finissimo Automatic was a sporty watch, at 30 meters water resistant, it wasn't a sports watch. Now, You've got the integrated bracelet, the stainless steel, the screw down crown, swimmable water resistance, and we are a loomed dial away from this being a class leading product. At $11,900, nothing else even comes close, at least nothing that's similar in, in quality. This is a watch that has dial, case, bracelet, clasp, and movement all made by Bulgari companies. That's a level of integration that even Alango Unzona hasn't achieved and they're tops for fine finish and quality. So this is a truly special watch that could be more so if only the dial had a minimum of loom. Even if it were just the hour and minute hand, this would achieve full-blown sports watch status, and it would be a watch that many folks would have to consider alongside timepieces costing three times as much. All right, wrist chats, let's take a look at yours on mine. Max L shares the vivid dial, and I must say it is a vivid dial, of this 2020 Breitling Super Ocean Heritage 57 capsule. Great capture of the capsule. Neil L. of San Francisco shares his Rolex GMT and a stunning cityscape of San Fran with the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. Bruce L. 
And it's 2020, Rolex Submariner, celebrate on a sunny day the next generation of bluesy. Alan M and his Seiko SNJ025 are out on the range in Boys Ranch, Texas. One horsepower, check it out. Francisco PG and his Watchbox bought IWC Perpetual Calendar, Portuguese or Cellini edition, hit the road with his Rentec Mercedes C63 AMG. A big thank you for trusting our company. Send me a shot of the full car too, you know I like those. All right, let's take a look at the box. Anthony saying, Anthony N, Anthony Napoli saying, the code 1159 needs a killer bracelet. Engineer Wannabe saying, hi Tim from Toronto. Thank you for joining me from the Great White North. We have Richard Weir staying up late in North Ireland. I appreciate that. Staying up late in Europe with me. And then da -da, we've got a lot of comments. This chat box moves so fast. I try to focus on a comment and it just disappears. We had a question from Naresh Pape. Is this Bulgarian stainless or titanium? The Bulgari you just saw, the water resistant one, is available right now in steel and red gold. So the watch you just saw was in stainless steel. Then we have Multi D Hill 12 asking, Tim, is the Cartier Santos blue dial still your favorite? Among the Santos options, you better believe. I liked the watch when it came out back in 2018, but I mean, here's the thing. A sports watch without a loomed dial, especially with a silver satin dial in that formal Cartier style, it seemed like a half measure. Once the blue dial arrived with a cool gradient fade, applied metal numerals, and loomed hands, combine that with the anti-magnetic properties of the movement and the water resistance, the sizable bracelet, the quick release lugs, yeah, one of the best watches available, and the fact that you can get it for under 7,000 bucks with an accessory strap and clasp, it's just an awesome product, a fantastic buy, and easily the Cartier to buy, not just the Santos to buy, but the Cartier to buy. Finally, right here, we have Horatio saying the Vacheron Constantin Overseas Ultra Thin in steel with a brown dial would be an absolute home run, and I really have to agree with you. If they were to bring that watch back in steel and fit the brown dial currently found on the other overseas models, I can't even imagine what kind of discussions would open at AP and Patek about finally doing generational turnovers of their respective jumbos. I think it would become necessary. All right. Jumping into independent watch brands. They're not perfect. They've made mistakes. They've come close. Fortunately, I've got the hookup and advice to fix what's wrong. Writing the wrongs, starting with F.P. Journe. Um, the B students who need to hit the books, starting with the F.P. Journe line sport. The sports watches at F.P. Journe. The irony here is that launched in 2011, they encompassed larger cases, more aggressive styles, loomed dials, integrated bracelets, advanced case materials, first aluminum, later titanium, rubber straps, sports style bracelets with rubber bumpers, and even as the dials grew supremely sporty in 2018 with the arrival of the yellow lacquer, and the cases swelled now to 44 millimeters from the original 42, the watches never gained the water resistance of true sports watches. So when collectors ask me, can I swim with my FP Journ, I always have to say, unless it's an Elegant 48 with the screw down crown, the answer is probably not. These have the same 30 meter water resistance as the standard Okta and Souverain dress watches, which is to say the fun ends at the water's edge. These are sporty watches, but you want to be able to swim with your sports watch. You can definitely do it with your Nautilus. You can definitely do it with your Longa Odysseus. You can do it with your Overseas. You can't do it with a push down crown and a 30 meter rating. Not right here. Awesome products, but waiting to take that next step. Now here's the other thing. We have aggressive sports styles and full aluminum movements. And I have to think that considering the expense and difficulty of tooling up to make aluminum movements, finding a way to upgrade the water resistance and the seals of these cases probably won't require any major structural changes. And there's a precedent for this because just in the last two years, Vacheron Constantin did exactly that when it took its original 30 meter rated Cadillac quasi sports watch in steel, and this is the cheapest Vacheron you can get with the Geneva Hallmark, so it's an interesting piece on that basis, but they took the Cadillac in steel and upgraded it, without changing much, from 30 meters to 100 meters, all of which is to say it's now automatic, fully loomed, and swimmable, and if F.P. Journe could make, or I should say Montre Journe, which is the company properly, can make that change to the Line Sport watches, then it would truly have awesome, and I sound like a broken record, 
class leading products in the line sport collection. They're already really cool watches that sell well. The ability to swim with abandon would make them close to perfect. And now a brand I love because frankly it's probably going to be my next watch. De Betun of Lauberson, Switzerland, a company that's been around since 2002, and they have probably launched more different styles and movements than any two independents in that time. But the icon for them, or the closest thing they have to an icon, is the GPHG Egidor winning DB28. The grand prize winner from 2011 was launched in 2010, and it has not changed much as a result. The success of the style and the accolades it has received make it easy to overlook the fact that it is a bullhead winder due to the floating lugs. The variable geometry lugs result in the relocation of the crown to 12 o'clock. And because, in spite of its water resistance of 30 meters, it is a screw-down crown. With the floating lugs, the screw-down architecture, it can be a little bit difficult to wind and set these watches, especially since all of them have twin barrel movements that have four, five, six days of power reserve. That's a lot of fiddling with a crown that's difficult to access. So I would say, this is the reason why within the Debetun catalog, I consider myself a DB25 kind of guy. Because the DB25 has a normal crown at 3 o'clock, and because the DB25 collection has the option of automatic winding on some models, which makes it easier to live with the watch. If they had that on the DB28, that too would be a lot easier to live with. And Debetun's DB28 would be a whole lot better if they could find a way to integrate an automatic movement. And that's basically what the DB27 is. It's floating lugs with an automatic winding movement. Or, if they want to stick with the design, if they could subtly integrate a bezel winding and setting system, uh, like the Ulysse Nordin Freak. The Ulysse Nordin Freak has a case back winding system and a bezel setting system. So you wind the case back like a knob, and then you turn to set the time on the the dial by rotating a lockable bezel. This is a solution that I feel Debatoon with its dozens of patents and in-house technical capability, I mean they make their own cases. This seems like something Debatoon could do. And I believe in the end it would result in their best watch yet. Now, jumping into the box, I hear Roar of the Tiger saying that race bred five cylinder quattro of the 80s, that Audi would be absolutely terrific to zig and zag in and out of traffic at full speed down a straightaway or bumper to bumper. Not to mention the clackety clack of its differential. That's true. We're talking early days for road going all wheel drive there. But it was like, I'm not even kidding, it was like an 85 inch wheelbase. That car could practically turn in its own length on dirt with four wheel drive. It was a crazy machine. That's like sell an organ cool. Like, Honestly, if I could sell just one organ and make that happen, I'd probably pull the trigger. But it's far more expensive than that. Right here, we have a question from Multi D. Tim, does your company take watches that are 100 years old, such as Hamilton pocket watches? You're welcome to offer it, but I gotta be honest, with something like that, you're better off going through a specialized pocket watch or vintage dealer. Uh, it's not necessarily the kind of thing we look to bring in, simply because parts, servicing, and documentation are impossible on a watch that old and specialized. We do sell pocket watches, though. We have Patek and IWC pocket watches right now. I just think due to the age and the lack of parts, that Hamilton would be something you'd want to sell through a specialist. All right. Now we have Al Horology saying, I own the yellow dial Jorn Santagraph. It is spectacular. That it is. I do believe it could be a bit more water resistant, but that is one hell of a watch. Now, one more group owned product warrants constructive criticism here, because in many regards, I still look at Alango Unzona with their design clarity, their uncompromising standards, their level of finishing on every, including the most basic watch. And I see a still burning independent spirit from the 1990s upstart that this company was. So the Alango Unzona Odysseus, it launched for this model year. This is Longa finally producing a series production, widely available, regular offering, stainless steel watch, and gloaming on to, if we're honest, the integrated bracelet steel sports watch trend. So let me be clear, I'm a fan of this watch and would gladly own one. At $28,800, we just talked about the Jumbo and the 5711, this watch is priced right. And we're talking almost $5,000 less than the Nautilus. Also, at 40.5 millimeters by 11.1 millimeters thick, the size is right. The date eight dial is unique, 
beautifully executed, handsome in detail. Can we go full screen on that? It truly does look as expensive as it is, perhaps even more so. Nicely executed, and so is the caliber. Everything you would want or expect in a Longa is present and correct, and it's swimmably water resistant. But the bracelet overpowers the lugs and the case. Look at that watch. It's like those guys you see from time to time whose necks are exactly as wide as their heads, and you always do like a double take and something just isn't quite right there. Well, that's kind of what the watch is like. That bracelet overpowers the lugs and and this is a bit of a mortal sin for a sports watch, the bracelet overpowers the case and the dial. So I would say the strap option looks far better. This pretty much reconciles all the issues I've got. The problem, a big part of the price of this watch, and that's the gold version you see right there, a big part of the price of the steel model is that bracelet which is a great piece, fully sizable with an extension built into the clasp. It's just the proportioning, it's not quite right. I know it, you know it, well we love the watch and would pay our own money to own it, it could be better. Just a little bit, and here's the thing, it needs to be fixed. As with the Audemars Piguet Code 1159, a small course correction here could transform perceptions of the watch. Moreover, we talked about it earlier, Rolex's Deep Sea 2018 lug and bracelet reprofiling proves just how fruitful small changes can be in this critical dimension of style and ergonomics, and I don't think Lange is far from that. It is not a sign of weakness to admit fault. It's a sign of strength to correct your course, and I think Lange can do that. Viewer wrist shots number four. I asked, you answered. Adrian B goes double vintage with his Abercrombie and Fitch Solinar by Hoyer and his 1967 Alfa Romeo GTV. I am hugely jealous. Send me a photo of the whole car, please. Abdul R, the newly minted engineering PhD in the Black Forest of Germany, peels back the Iron Curtain with his Russian Raketa Copernicus and holiday beverages. Marcio M of the Netherlands watches Holland beat Belgium in the 2020 Tour of Flanders won by Mathieu van der Poel. Bradley S. of North Carolina and his Rolex Explorer, Explore DuPont State Forest. Nicely shot. Love the strap. And then Khalid A. and his Speedmaster CK2998 watch the sunset over Dubai with the Atlantis Resort Island in the background. A wonderful way to close our show. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. And remember, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. The direct contact if you want to buy one of our watches or sell one of your watches. And Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Join me, I'm posting videos every day. Time out, Tim out. Thanks to Sean, thanks to Josh, my studio audience, and thanks for logging on.